So you've been using B1, right? How, how long have you been using it in patients? Since May 28th, four months. So, so prior to that, had you, um, had you learned much about like therapeutic B1, high dose B1, anything like that? No, I had benfotiamine in my inventory for more than 10 years. Right. I just never learned about it, never learned it, never used it. Right. So you've, um, so you've started using it in, in patients and what kind of thing do you use it for? So if you have a patient, like what kind of um, presentation would you, would you apply it to? Well, the way that I see it now is, see, it's a bigger picture than just like looking at symptoms, right? So I, I got to go back to the beginning of my career. Um, so I'm a chiropractor. I decided in school to focus on nutrition and I graduated in 97, started practicing nutrition in 98. I'd been studying it since 93 and and I quit taking insurance in 2005. So I'm in the free market, right? Like patients pay me directly to get them better. There's no third party that mm -hmm. controls what I say or do. And so now we're talking 19 years of cash practice and it's a large practice. You know, we, I have four other nutrition practitioners. I'm hiring a couple more soon. And the thing that changed my career, my path is, um, I moved into a moldy office in 2004. I started getting heart symptoms in 2009. And by 2016, that's a year that I thought I was going to die. I had four EKGs that year. I had horrible heart symptoms, high blood pressure, chest pain, difficulty breathing, swollen feet, body temperature was low. And I started seeing all these other doctors and specialists. I saw a fantastic cardiologist and Nobody gave me answers, and I knew, I kind of knew nobody would give me answers, but in February of, um, of 2016, I started reading old books. Now, I have a collection, I already had a collection of like old medical and nutrition textbooks going back to the 19 teens through the 1960s. I saw that. You, I saw that. I thought that's really cool. Not many people do that, by the way. Uh, and, right. And and I saw that you'd done that and, and you really find some gems in, in those kind of books, right? Oh yeah, for sure. Well, that's where I found lactic acidosis. So in the 1930s, the lactic acidosis was a clinical mechanism of chronic illness and all the doctors and students of medicine knew about it. They studied it. They tried to fix it. And I thought if they could fix lactic acidosis, then they could fix chronic disease, but they're missing information that we know now we, we have heavy metals and chemical toxicities, parasites, mold, um, et cetera, et cetera, that causes disease and the mechanism is lactic acidosis. So they didn't understand that at the time. But now we know about causes, at least in the holistic field, we know about causes, but we we forgot about the mechanism and you want to address both. So when I, when I read that article, it was from 1959, um, I, 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 there was one sentence. I was like, this is it. Oh my gosh, this explains all of chronic disease. And so I started to apply the therapies that they had in the 1930s. There's a company called Standard Process that started mm -hmm. in 1929, and their formulas are the same, if not similar, to what they were back in the 1930s. So they had supplements that would address lactic acidosis. They still have them. And I started taking one in particular that kept all my symptoms at bay. And I survived the summer and then, um, but I didn't find what, the cause. What was that? Do you remember? What was that? Yeah. The name of that supplement now is called Cataplex B2. At the time it was called Cataplex G. So I took a lot. I took 25 a day for six weeks and I was like, oh, you know, like this, this is great, but I still like, if I didn't take it, I felt worse. So it's like, okay, I still need to find the cause. So then in October of 2016, um, I found the cause, which being being the mold in that office and the the building has this um, porous outside walls. So sideways rain would drive water into the building and it would touch the drywall. And all it takes is 24 hours of moisture and then the starts growing mold. Right. So, so I had, but I had these horrible symptoms. So I started detoxing mold. Um, I took a product called Biotoxin Binder for two pills a day for seven years. And my labs show that the mold is out, the mycotoxins are out. I moved out of that building 
five years ago, six years ago now. But then the spring, all these symptoms came back. So we're talking March of 2024, March, April, May. And what I think precipitated that was I had um, the Invisalign, which uh, prevented me from chewing for 19 months. And also, um, I had in, uh, I was studying a lot, and I gave a lecture in February of 2024 in front of 175 medical doctors, where I debated a vegan on stage. And so I studied really hard for from July of 2023 to February of 2024. I just studied so hard, and I I I burnt up my B1, which you know I didn't know at the time. So add on top of that mold you and you said aspergillus mycotoxins crush b1 in the body it destroys b1 so i had yeah. the mold studying a lot high stress burn up the b1 and then it couldn't chew food for 19 months so put all three of those together and then march april may of 2024 i'm starting to get high blood pressure chest pain crushing chest pain difficulty breathing shortness of breath left arm numbness and in april i thought i had a stroke left arm and left leg numb body temperature cold. I'm laying in bed at 8.30 at night. Like, what the heck's happening? And um, so finally, uh, towards the end of May, actually May 17th was a Friday, I spent the night in the in a bedroom with uh, windows closed, uh, doors door closed, and no ventilation, no air conditioning or heat on. And I woke up in the morning feeling horrible, high blood pressure for me, 135 over 85 is very high and crushing chest pain. And as the sun was coming up, this is at a lake, my parents have a cottage on a lake. So as the sun's coming up over the lake, beaming right into the picture window, the temperature in the room was getting higher and higher. And that my breathing was getting worse and worse. And I was like, and my blood pressure was 139 over 102. And I'm like, I gotta go, I'm going to urgent care, crushing chest pain, eight out of 10. So I, I drove back home, went to urgent care, they did an EKG, which was normal. And they said, you have to go to the ER because we can't do any blood draws or anything else. So go to the ER. So I went to a small hospital, not too far from my house. So near my house, I have the University of Michigan Hospital in Ann Arbor, Michigan, right? Like one of the, you know, top medical education facilities. And yeah. I didn't go there, which is a blessing in disguise. So I go to the small hospital and they hook me up with all these cords. And it's a Saturday morning, 11.45 in the morning. And they they left for an hour. They just walked out of the room um, as fast as they could, to be honest. And they didn't say, we'll be back in an hour. We're going to lunch. See you soon. They didn't say anything like that. They just left. And I think that they knew they couldn't help me. Because when I walked in there, I was like, look, I test my bloods. Everything's normal. Cholesterol is normal. APOB, B, oxidized LDL. It's all normal. Mm -hmm. And she said, I believe you. And I was like, I'm a healthy chiropractor, low carb diet, exercise, go to the gym once or twice a week. I'm, I, I go, I don't know what's going on. And she's like, yeah, we'll have to figure something out. But I think she knew she would, wasn't able to help me. That was at the beginning of that visit. So when they left, I was watching my monitor and it showed my respirations had five to eight seconds between inhale exhale so it's like inhale exhale and then five to eight seconds later inhale exhale and i'm watching myself not breathe like mm. what the heck is that like does that raise blood pressure if i'm holding my breath or not breathing does that raise blood pressure and i'm like okay i'm freaking out i'm in the er i need to relax i just just relax so then i fell asleep and then the monitor starts beeping red and it said apnea 20 seconds. Mm. So I'm like, okay. So then I'm like, okay, so let me just breathe. I'm just going to breathe intently, which was a struggle. And over the next 20 minutes, the blood pressure cuff came on twice. And I lowered my top number, which was about, you know, 134 or whatever. I dropped it down to 120. It was my blood pressure was normal just because I was breathing. So then mm. they came in. And they're going to put a line, you know, poke into my arm. And I was like, oh, look, it says apnea on the monitor. Doesn't that raise blood pressure? And he goes, oh, that just means that your cord fell off or the skin contact was bad. It's a bad reading. So they dismissed, they dismissed it twice. 
And it's like, no, no, I think I'm not breathing. So anyways, we did a CT scan of my brain with a dye contrast. The visit was five hours long. It cost me $10,000. I don't have health insurance. Oh, man. And I walked out of there. <laughs> it was a very expensive visit, but it was a re really good career move because I've been helping all these people. And in my clinic, I've put, you know, over 200 mics, me and my staff, we put over 200 people on B1 with great results, right? And anyways, um, so I'm like, I know how to fix apnea. Like I've been fixing apnea for more than 15 years. Mm -hmm. So I took apnea supplements for a week and I was a little bit better, but it was still very much a struggle. And so then the week goes by and a later, uh, and a patient tells me, and I'm doing a video conference with her and her program is doing well, she's doing better. And she says, oh, by the way, I've been taking synthetic B1 in high doses for four months and all of my neuropathy is gone. Hmm. I, was like, I was like, wait a minute, I have neuropathy in my arm and my leg. Maybe I need B1. So I had the Benfo timing. I've been carrying that for over 10 years. I just never really used it. Yeah. So I, I did, we do this biofeedback procedure, like a testing procedure. And so I took um, 450 milligrams of B1. And within one hour, I was breathing better, easier. And I was like, this is it. Like, this is the solution. And it totally makes sense because of lactic acidosis, which I've been studying. You know, I figured that out in 2016. Mm -hmm. And um, using low dose B vitamins, because that's what they did in the 1930s. And that's what I was learning from, from the 1930s. Dr. Henry yeah. Herwer, Dr. Royal Lee, Dr. Um, Otto Warburg. Mm -hmm. And that's, they all said the same thing about you got to fix the cause and the, and the um, mechanism. And then you feed the organs to get rid of symptoms. You got to do mm -hmm. all three. So that's my front page of my website. You got to fix all three. So anyways, two weeks go by on high dose B1, chest pain gone, apnea gone. I was using an app on the phone called Snorlab. And I was, you know, it showed that it had apnea and also um, blood pressure normal. Two weeks, all this stuff went away, except for the numbness. And now it's been four months and I'd have to say my numbness is 90 to 95% better. So just that peripheral neuropathy can take a bit of time to fix up. But um, so... So your original question is what symptoms or what case presentations um, do I apply the B1 to? The answer is everybody, because it, it's the main way to fix lactic acidosis, the mechanism of chronic disease. So here's, here's how it works. Here you have W, this is W for waste. That's pathogens and toxins. And then here you have O for oxygen. So this is lactic acidosis, too much waste, not enough oxygen in the blood. So the cells starve and they're filled with toxins. They can't dump their waste into the blood because the blood's already toxic. And so the blood can't carry the toxins away and your body, your tissues, your cells, they're, it's all starting to starve and die. And when, when muscle cells die, they tighten up and that's rigor mortis. So that's, you know, like people can't breathe because their cells, their, their muscle cells are tightening up. That's the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles. And then they get fibromyalgia and their neck muscles are tight. So that's a common symptom of lactic acidosis. Also, um, the, another uh, anxiety is another extremely common uh, symptom. And then of course, everything else, every, the bottom line is when there's not enough oxygen in the blood, the, the cells and the tissues start to die. So you got to address the waste by detoxing and uh, removing um, pathogens. And then you increase the oxygen. So since 2016, I've been increasing oxygen with low dose whole food vitamins with decent results. But now I know that B1 is the single greatest nutritional supplement to shoot that oxygen up super fast in high doses, you know, high doses of oxygen. Now you can have the oxygen saturation measurement from your finger that can be at 99 or, or hundred, but yet the oxygen isn't leaving your blood going into your cells. So that's what B1 does. And that's what Otto Warburg found out in 1929 in his lab. And he got the Nobel prize for that in 1931. So B1 at the time was called the ferment of respiration or the oxygen transferring ferment. 
so they didn't use the word vitamin b1 but that's but that's, that's interesting sorry just interject there because uh if you yeah i've got got my hands on one of these books it's, it's one of the oldest books published uh from it was a translation from japan so it was a bunch of japanese researchers they published it in the 1960s and it was a I'll have to I'll actually see if I can if I can scan this and then send it to you because I think you'd really like it, but it's out of print and it cost me a fortune. Anyway, um basically what 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 they did is they they uh they summarized all of the studies up until then, so from like 1920, and since they discovered it, they started using it, they started isolating these different forms in Japan and coming up synthesizing all these forms. Anyway, uh one of the signs and symptoms or one of the the things that they found in practically every single patient and then the oxygen stays in the blood now it's in the veins and there's too much oxygen in the veins not enough carbon dioxide that's what they found that's yeah. what they found sorry high oxygen high oxygen concentration in the vascular blood low oxygen concentration in the arterial blood which is the opposite of what you should ordinarily find you should ox arterial blood is Ox heavily oxygenated it should go into the cells and then pass into the vascular system where it returns to then be dispelled as carbon right. dioxide right. but they found the opposite demonstrating that actually people weren't able to accept more oxygen at the level of the lung because they were not able to basically dispose of the oxygen in the cells and generate yeah, co2 yeah. i got you 100 basically what you're saying but that's what they found like in the 1930s in japan and they couldn't make sense of it so i th just yeah. thought I'd, i thought you might be interested in that this video is brought to you by my office. We use new and old clinical discoveries, solving complex chronic illnesses using only diet and supplements. We have this fantastic building. We have multiple practitioners. We do local and distance consultations. We help you improve your health as opposed to just squashing symptoms. And we have a variety of opportunities for you to get involved. We have eBooks and courses that are free. We have eBooks and courses that are paid for. I have my large seven step blueprint to optimal health online course, which walks you through the seven step blueprint to optimal health. And you have access to all the supplements at patient pricing. My book is available on Kindle. If you want to buy supplements from my office, we have this store, which is for patients only. And we have this store, which is for everybody else. But if you just want to jump into direct care immediately, just contact the office directly. What did Otto Warburg, he spoke about B1 or what they just called it like the, what did they call it? The fermentation complex Well, in 1926, B1 was called the, it was called vitamin because it was the first vitamin ever discovered. And then by 1929, in the laboratory of Otto Warburg, it was a ferment. It was uh, from nutritional yeast, I believe. And they called it the ferment of respiration because when they gave this, to people or to animals or whatever, and they measured as animals, they measured um, the respiration increased dramatically. So it's called the ferment of respiration or the respiratory enzyme. Interesting. Okay. So I think a lot of that's been lost because just the translation, you know, the, the voc vocabulary's changed. Yeah. 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 So uh, all the things that you said about the oxygen transferring in the lungs and the respiration, the mitochondria, all that stuff. That's amazing information. So my, the most common thing that I see is that people who start B1, let's say they have apnea at night and they're using a CPAP machine, they wake up in the morning, they, have, they are a perkier, they have more energy, thumbs, thumbs up, and they, um, they get rosy cheeks again, they're off the couch more during the day. You know, all these great things happen when they're just, it's breathing, right? It's like, how important is that? It's like the most important thing you can do and uh, yeah. the results come pretty quickly. It's pretty amazing. What was the timeline exactly again? So if you could just repeat exactly what was the timeline from, because because you've been into nutrition for a long time. Um, what was it that triggered? Because what you'd had this episode with mold back in what, like you said 2006? 2004 to 2016 is when I was in that moldy office. Okay, 2004. Okay, so but since 2016, that's what eight years ago. You've been you've been managing that. You've you've figured out ways to basically detox the mold and and address those issues. But what about um? What was the just to clarify because I, I didn't quite get it. What was exactly the trigger that triggered this episode where you had to go to the hospital uh, very recently? Well, the exact trigger was spending a night in a bedroom that had poor circulation right okay. the door is closed windows that? are closed and I woke up like you know like f feeling bad and then as the morning went on by 9 a.m 
crushing chest pain, eight out of 10, you know, just difficulty breathing, blood pressure, 139 over 102. That's what triggered me to go to the ER. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that, so that speaks to low oxygen. So when you're in this bedroom, right, carbon dioxide is going up because I'm breathing all night. Right. So, and then, so that's the same when people have social anxiety, they're at a party and they're blaming, there's oh, so many people, right. They're like, Oh, yeah. I, I don't, I can't stand the people. No, there's a lack of oxygen in the room and you're, 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 you're poorly utilizing oxygen in the first place before you walked in that room. So then they go get a psychiatric drug from a doctor when they need mm -hmm. B1 for their so social anxiety. Right? right or like chest pain on and on and on like i'm telling you all, all the symptoms right and i've said i said this in 2016 when i figured out lactic acidosis it's like the the professions of cardiology psychiatry endocrinology gastroenterology all these professions would lose a ton of money if people started taking b1 like right i said that eight years ago but i didn't say it like that in 2016 i didn't say take b1 i said fix lactic acidosis so let me just go on a little bit more about that so in order to fix lactic acidosis you have to drop down those waste products so then there's detoxing metals and that can take a year or three years or detoxing mold it took me seven years to get the mold out right so like you can take b1 and feel better and breathe better and have your better digestion all these great things but don't forget to get to the cause also mm -hmm. Uh, could you clarify once more, very succinctly, exactly what symptoms did you present with that? I mean, you went to the hospital and they basically told you they couldn't help you. So, so could you just list off those symptoms? Because, because when you listed them before, they they were quite, they seemed quite severe. <laughs> they were severe, right? So that morning, I, I I had crushing chest pain, eight out of ten, over my heart, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing arm numbness, left arm numb. And um, I had also had left leg numb from a few weeks earlier. Mm. And high blood pressure. So for me, 135 over 85 is very high. And it should right. be, you know, 115 over 65. That'd be my normal. So those are my four main, four or five main symptoms. Okay. And what, crushing chest pain, eight out of 10? Eight out of 10. Most yeah. people would be worried that that was potentially uh, something worse, wow. right? Right. But so I went to the see, hospital, but they checked that. Right. And I, I got four EKGs in 2016 because I had the mold and the heart symptoms from that time. Mm -hmm. I had a coronary artery calcium score of zero. I've had all my lipids and all my glucose, A1C. Everything is normal, normal, normal. Right. Everything. None of the risk factors for heart attack, basically. Right. Except for one thing, I had lipoprotein A, which is high. It's been high ever since I've ever tested it. But that single factor alone is not an indicator of any heart disease. Right. Right. So like everything else normal. And just by coincidence. And luckily, I'm in this profession of nutrition for healing chronic disease. And luckily, my patients are smart and they do their own research and I learn a lot from them. And that's what happened. 10 days after the hospital visit, mm -hmm. I'm talking with my patient. She goes, yeah, I've been on synthetic B1 high dose for four months and all my neuropathy has gone. I'm very happy. I'm like, okay, wait, maybe I need it. And then an hour later, I'm breathing much easier. And that, that was it. It's like, right. oh, and then I'm like, okay, so what is this B1? What am I missing? So I go on YouTube, Benfo timing, and you pop up. So I'm like, yeah. okay, cool. <laughs> so then you go down the rabbit hole, of course. Yeah. And learn and then I buy, about so, B1. Right. So then I get the book that we love, um, Thiamine Deficiency Disease, Dysautonomia and High Calorie Malnutrition. Yeah. Right. And I go to my old books that I already had, 1944. There's a huge chapter on B1 in this one. And then this was 1931, the, the vitamins talk about b1 high, you know yeah back then high dose was two milligrams or 30 yeah. 30 milligrams but yeah right. 1931 okay 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 so i mean okay the question i have now for you why do you think 
do you think it was your kind of long-term exposure to mold um mycotoxins other things which are causative of diseases that that made you susceptible to developing uh an insufficiency of b1 like I'm, i'm saying before this episode where you went to the hospital so just so i have it clearer in my mind you we're in the situation where you had this night of poor oxygenation and then you were, you got these very severe debilitating symptoms. You'd gone to the hospital, you'd explain, well, you know, none of the risk factors are there for the heart attack. It doesn't look like you had a heart attack, even though you'd have eight out of 10 crushing chest pain, not really sure what caused it. The doctors aren't sure what caused it. They can't help you just by chance. Well, so the, you you do some nutritional stuff, you 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 manage that in the best way that you can, and then just by chance you happen to randomly start trying a, a high dose uh, thiamine supplement four month, uh, sorry, ten days later, and you find that it addresses those symptoms, on, like surprisingly, addresses those symptoms when you weren't originally even trying to address the problem with breathing. You were actually just looking to to improve some neuropathy which you've been having. Well, I had I had done a lot of for that ten days between the visit to the ER and talking to my patient. Yeah, I did a lot of box breathing and I got some breathing um, apps, and I was sitting in front of a window just getting the breeze in. None of that helped. Okay, so you were doing a lot on that front, but only when you took the B one did you or Benfo time in to be specific. Uh, you noticed that you were breathing immediately better. Here's a question though. Why do you think that you responded like that? Because that is indicative of a of a of an insufficient level of thiamine. But you follow a very clean diet. You are a, a long term, well established health practitioner. Why do you think that you were susceptible to that? Even though you do everything else right, you know why what was, was it that made you susceptible to that? That's what I'm interested. Why was I susceptible well. to the B1 deficiency? Yeah. Well. The mold in the previous office I was in for 12 or 13 years comes mm-hmm. up again. Yep. So there, so I detox that out. Okay, but there's several um, other factors. There's the mold, and then I had the Invisalign. And mm-hmm. um, for uh, 19 months, I couldn't chew food. That was a disaster. So I was deficient in B1 because you can't assimilate nutrients if you're not digesting well. Um, also, low-carb keto diet. Since I've been low carb since 1999, mm-hmm. and I, I'm still a fan of low carb, but to be honest, there's no diet that supplies enough B1 for a modern stressful lifestyle. Okay, right. but low carb junk food, a standard American diet, um, high fat, I should say high fat keto diet doesn't have B1 in it because fat does not have B vitamins because B vitamins are water soluble. So those are the three factors right there. The fourth factor being the amount of... um brain power I used from July of 2023 to February of 2024, studying for a lecture that I gave in front of 175 medical doctors at the end of of February. So I burned up my B1, you know, the more brain power you use, and the more and going to the gym, I love going to the gym and exercising. I think that if anybody is using their body and brain more than a caveman, they -hmm. should be taking 250 milligrams of regular B1 salt you know, just uh, thiamine hydrochloride or something. So there, there's there's five factors right there that uh, cause my B1 deficiency. But the biggest one being the mold exposure for those 12 or 13 years. Right. And but this is this is interesting because, you know, I tend to agree with what you've said, although this, this is a fairly non-conventional stance, right? When it comes to understanding nutritional deficiencies, like you said, for instance, using brain power, Someone will say, well, well, how does using your brain increase the demand for nutrients? Or how does chronic stress or how does stress increase the demand for certain nutrients? And and like you, I I, I think I would I would I would be in agreement with you if you were to say that, okay, first of all, you're using using your brain, you've under a lot of stress, or you are um ultimately at a um greater likelihood of developing a deficiency because of past insults as well. Uh, all of these things, I think, uh, factor into the complexity or, or factor into why someone may be more or have a greater propensity right. towards having 
a deficiency. There is a great demand for some reason. And, and a lot well, of people the, don't let me, really let me, understand sorry. that. Yeah, let me, under, let me interrupt you. Sorry. So, I mean, basically, it's mitochondrial function creating ATP. So you have a high stress level. Brain-wise, you need more ATP. You just yeah. burn up the B1. And yeah. you use a lot of um, um, body power, muscle power. That's ATP being used up in order to resupply the ATP. You need B1 to get the mitochondria to work. There's like five biochemical reactions that the B1 is responsible for within the mitochondria. So just you Indeed. just use it up. Just run out of gas. And then you get... Then you get the end stages of chronic disease. You get lactic acidosis, cachexia, you know, heart attack, cancer, all the horrible things. So, right, and 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 uh, this is something that's not conventionally like appreciated. I think by the research community, they will consider what the top five causes of vitamin B one deficiency to be alcoholism. Uh, if you've got any severe gastric malabsorption disorder like Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease, something like that. Uh, there's a couple of other risk factors, but they generally won't look at lifestyle factors or even diet to a large extent. They won't really look at someone's diet. Right. And you mentioned it as well, you know, this concept of being on a high fat ketogenic diet or lower carb diet. Well, that's great in some ways because of all the benefits that it has. I know you've discussed this extensively on your channel, right? Um, but at the same time, just looking at the biochemistry, it would also seem that being on a diet like that requires that you need less B1. You know, it's like That's you true. use potentially up to half of it. But what that also means is that you likely get much less in the diet anyway, because high thiamine foods right. also tend to be richer in carbohydrate, you know, legumes, uh, starches, those kinds of things. And it's, there's an interesting correlation there. It's like, well, maybe you need less if you're on a keto or low carb diet. But what it also means is that you're probably getting less as well. So you've got less wiggle room as that if you do have other stresses, which increases demand for B1, that might also tip you over the edge. And if you're not getting it from the diet, and I don't know, that may, may, have, may have played a role in your case as well, like you said. Yeah, I'm sure um, it did. Right. And so I was talking to somebody about this and he said, well, what, what did people do before they had B1 supplements? And they said they died. So my great grandfather had a heart attack in the 1930s and he was on the couch for five years. He couldn't breathe. He gave the farm to his three sons, which the oldest being my grandfather. And then they gave him an oxygen tank. We're, again, we're talking 1930s. He couldn't afford the oxygen tank. So they took it away from him and then he died. Okay, there's that. Now my grandfather had heart disease for 50 years. And when I started practice in 1997, 98, he told me, he came in as a patient. I recommended some supplements. He goes, I, he goes, I can't take any more pills. I'd rather just die than take more pills because they had him on so many medications. But he said on an x-ray, his heart was enlarged chest wall to chest wall. That's a B1 deficiency. And then he died in 2001. He had a heart attack, right? He just, and they never, they never cured him. And then my cousin who was my age, he died 11 years ago in an environment that had low oxygen. It was like a, you could call it a farming accident, but he also had an enlarged heart and he was in a low oxygen environment and he passed away. So there's three relatives right there. All three of them needed B1 in high doses. None of it, none of their cardiologists, none of their, and we've known this since 1931. And so there's all these people, how many millions of people are currently under the care of a medical doctor and they just need B1 in high doses and they have to remove the toxins and pathogens out of their body. Have you have you considered that maybe um that maybe your family has has some kind of a mild mutation in in thiamine yeah. transport, thiamine utilization, that's quite or common, storage. right? <laughs> yeah. Or storage, and right? Other people would say, "Oh, it's a heart you have bad uh, genes for heart disease." Right. No, it's bad genes for B1 transport, utilization, storage. It's a genetic. There's definitely a genetic thing there, as with right. a lot of families. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it will present as uh, dysautonomia. You know, or sometimes, I mean, I've had some some patients who will say, oh, well, I have chronic gastroparesis. I've had it since I was like 12 years old, and I'm chronically constipated. I've been on laxatives for 20 years, and I'm also dizzy all the time. And by the way, my mum 
is also like that. And then my grandmother is also like that. And we don't really know why. And then you give them vitamin B1 and it disappears. And then they give it to their grandmother or their mother. And it also disappears. So in those cases, it's not something, I mean, it's interesting because the genetics of B1 deficiency aren't even all that clear. And it's not something that you would ever find on like a 23andMe panel and no one's really looking for it. So we don't know how common it is. Right. It's, that's the yeah. case. And I have a lot of patients who are as, as excited as I am and they give it to their brother, their son, their mom, whoever, and they get better too, which is awesome. Yeah. Okay. So, so could you tell us a little bit more? You, you explain your experience. You tried it after those 10 day period and you noticed improvements in your, in your breathing. Did you, did you say you also noticed improvements in the neuropathy as well? Right. So the neuropathy, it's been four months, um, almost to the day. And so my neuropathy left arm, left foot is, um, I'm, I'm going to say 90% better. And there's full days where I don't notice it at all. Whereas okay. before it's like, I can feel it all the time. So it just takes longer to fix up. But yeah, the neuropathy is it's going away. It's, it's, I'm looking forward to it. So there's an improvement there for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's very clear that at least part of the pathophysiology of what you were experiencing was due to some impairment of B1 metabolism or B1 utilization, because there's no way that it would respond so well to that. Uh, what you took for, right. was it 400 milligrams of benfotiamine? 450 milligrams on that first time, that first dose. Okay. And then I've been averaging about 750 milligrams a day of B1 right. and TTFD. What's interesting right. is that I started the B1 uh, benfotiamine very happy with the results. And a week or two goes by. And in one of your videos, you said that TTFD might be better. I'm paraphrasing. Might be better for some patients, but benfotiamine is great if they need that. Well, mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I'm going to stop benfotiamine and just go on TTFD. Within six hours, I was worse. And then that, at the end of the second day, I was like ready to go back to the urgent care. This right. is just, this is still like June, right? If, and so I was like, what am I missing? What did I do? Oh, I stopped benfotiamine. So once right. I started that, that back up, within six hours, I was better again.